the lines of this airplane. She's a pretty bird. But then we're going to look at some more of the details there. We've got three strong points from the designer of this airplane that's helped set it apart from any other airplane. We'll cover those in a minute. But first, I'm drawn to this engine compartment. There's a lot of people that have done nice engine compartments and, and they look tidy and neat and you can get at it, you can get down here to work on it and do things. But somehow, maybe it's the shiny parts and I'm intrigued by that or maybe it's just so well done, but this is a very, very clean engine installation. And I think we're gonna find some of these same qualities when we look around the rest of the airplane. We look at the firewall here. First of all, it's a nice solid firewall, just as it's supposed to be for fire resistance. This is required on their ASTM standards. But as we look up close here, first of all, they tell me this is an inexpensive battery, and you can get it almost anywhere. It's only a $58 battery instead of the several hundred that airplane batteries can sometimes be. The fluid for uh, cooling is has a, uh, a nipple on the top of the cap here, so that in case uh, this boils over or something happens, there's a vent to it that takes it all the way down. It doesn't corrode the inside of the firewall or other engine parts. It's a little thing perhaps, but it's an important thing because corrosion, once it happens, is hard to get rid of. Finally, over here on the voltage regulator, very simple thing. Instead of having it face up where it can collect moisture and have corrosion happens, he turned it and faced it down. Again, a very simple decision, but one that helps the owner of the airplane to not have maintenance problems downstream. That's important. And finally, these are two devices here that send uh, information, uh, the, the sensors down here, you can see the connectors send information to the Dynon instrument, which has so much capability to it. But they're usually mounted, they tell me, down on the engine itself where they get vibration. Here on uh, rubber lord mounts, or, or iso uh, vibration isolation mounts, it, that doesn't happen, and therefore the Dynon gets better information, the pilot has better information to work with. So I asked Milan if he said, I said, give me three things that set this airplane apart from other LSA. We've got a lot of nice airplanes out here, and you need to differentiate somehow. Every owner needs to know a few things. Milan expresses to me that the cockpit width is something he spent some time on, and the main width is right here, which happens to be about where your elbows are, and that's really where you need the most room. A lot of airplanes are wide back here, and that's fine, but you don't need that width back there. You need the width up here where you're moving and... And, uh, and, and adjusting things and having your arms move around. So that's one important thing. Not only that it's wide, and it is wide, but where the width is is important. Item number two has to do with the, sp uh, the spar here, which you can easily identify by this dual line of rivets. And the spar here has been designed in such a way that it never reaches the fatigue limit of the materials. And what does that mean? It's not gonna mean the airplane's necessarily gonna fly any different, but as the owner, keeps this airplane for a long time, he'll never reach the fatigue limit of the materials, and so this airplane will last longer. Therefore, whatever you spend on this airplane is just going to give you value for a longer time. The third thing is perhaps the most subtle of all, because if you look at airplanes, there's a lot of them that are kind of rounded, and they're probably rounded for a good reason. And by rounding, I'm talking about this quality right here, where this is curved here. Now, doing this in metal, as opposed to composite, is more work. You've got to do some real work to make these panels just fit right, and they clearly do. He's clearly got this down after his fifth generation design. But the important thing about that is that it helps to vent turbulence through, so you get more utility out of your airplane. So it's more comfortable, it's strong and won't reach its limits, and it's more comfortable in turbulence. Those are all three good things that any owner should want. They warned me not to fall asleep in this airplane, and we'll come back to why they said that in a minute, but you can guess, it's a comfortable seat. First of all, look at this panel. We've got some really cool equipment here. The True Track EFIS electronic flight information system, made by the same folks that are so commonly doing the uh, autopilot sun. The first people that really won their teeth in LSA was True Track for doing autopilot work. But, so they've got the True Track EFIS, they've got the new Garmin 796 here. This, you hit this little button here, and the whole thing removes, and you can go inside your motel or the flight office and make your adjustments about it, uh, plan your next flight and so forth. And then finally, this is a thing we've seen in more and more airplanes, but this is a very nice installation. And again, looks like it just popped right out. Take it out with you. This is the Apple iPad, which is becoming more and more common in the aircraft cockpit, including the airline cockpit. They're now using these for in flight information and charts and so forth. So you can take it inside, plan your flight, check weather, or watch a movie or do your email. So a pretty versatile uh, installation, and yet it looks how, again, the clean look of this is very impressive. But 
I gotta tell you, boy, these seats really are comfortable and they have one of my favorite qualities to them. They come up high enough, there's good rest here and there's good head support. That's great, that's always valuable. But the part I like is this long seat cushion. This is coming all the way out to my knees, in fact, a little bit past my knees and I really could sit in this airplane for a long time. Now, control system, we're gonna use it to well, we've got a dual joystick here, so both sides obviously. We also have uh, dual rudder pedals and dual tow brakes on each side, so you've got all the same conventional controls that any GA pilot is already used to. In the center, we've got our throttle, we've got our uh, choke over here. Choke is used commonly. GA pilots don't always know about chokes, but uh, all Rotax pilots know about it. Help you start the engine in certain weather conditions and so forth. And then again, a very simple execution, fuel uh, selector valve, and uh, flaps which are electronic with the indicator built right on and this is kind of a neat little trick instead of having to look at another place to see how much flaps you put on it's right where you turn the knob and uh, in addition you've got trim with an indicator up here and some other uh, switches and so forth the circuit breakers all located and right in front of the pilot a lot of times these are located over here and you've got it you can't always see them as well it's a nice presentation the way they've done this. Looks like great ventilation coming through the cabin as well in the uh, left and right hand. Yeah, you got a couple of big ones here. Of course, first of all, we got a big, huge bubble canopy, but it does not have inlets there, and you don't need them because it's got great big ones right down here. And I'm guessing there's some down near your feet too. Is that correct, Milan? We're asking the designer to come in here and give us a little advice. Daddy. There are these independent vents, okay. which are, which are inlets uh, from the Naka inlets like on the sides. Uh -huh. And uh, even they are, there is also the car system, which makes the, on the firewall, on the bottom side of the firewall, is divider, ah, like okay. in the cars. And uh, the divider has for winter time intake from heat exchanger for heating. Okay. And then you can variate the heating come uh, down on the legs or up on the bubble. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, for summertime, you, uh, you disconnect the heat exchanger and connect fresh air to the divider and then you can play it with fresh air on the legs, on the bubble and even have these two scoops more. Okay. So when the customers are worried about the hot air in Florida in summertime that we they don't see any sliding windows on the bubble, I explain to them that here is car system of ventilation which is much more efficient as, as, of, as, as on most of the airplanes and that's uh, it's uh, enough efficient to, to cool the cockpit even in the hot area like in Florida or in on Australia is the same. Well and one more feature you didn't point out. When you do bring the canopy down yes. you've got an opaque area above you. Yes. It doesn't look like that's gonna block hardly any visibility but it will keep some of the sun off and I also see it's got a handle up there yeah. which uh, my arms aren't quite long enough but you get down a little closer that'll help you pull it down snugly I assume. Just grab right up here first okay. So another little feature about the iPad, of course, you know, these devices need to be charged and battery does last a long time in them, but they've added a USB port. I don't know of another airplane that has a USB port. This may be the first, but here's the wire. It comes right down here. You can just plug this in. Anybody who has an iPad or an iPhone knows about that plug-in. goes in the bottom there. And also one so that you can charge your cell phone. Why not be able to do that? Everybody has these devices. That's a nice extra feature, part of what they thought through in a fifth generation design like this. In addition to the, the cool instruments in the panel, and sometimes it's maybe what's above the panel. First of all, you get a little eyebrow. This is sometimes called an eyebrow panel, which shields the panel from sunlight coming in. So that makes it easier to see these beautiful electronic devices. Plus, you can't see it too well, but there's a handle here and a handle here that helps you get in and out of the airplane. Low wing airplanes and you're seated low, that's a nice help. And finally, there's a row of lights here which your camera will not show, but I'm gonna trace where it goes all the way along here, kind of like those Christmas lights that come in a little tube, except these are blue. And with the dimmer switch and the, and the master on, of course, uh, you can turn those up and it, it casts a blue uh, glow around those instruments, which is good for the eye at night. It doesn't disturb your night vision so much. So, a few numbers about the airplane that are useful, and I'm using a card here to make sure I get exactly the right information. Cabin width is voluminous, that's obvious, you can see that, but how voluminous? 51 inches plus. That's a good 12, 13 inches more than a Cessna 172. That's a big wide cockpit for big boys, can get in here easily. And anybody smaller than a great big guy is just going to feel really roomy. Uh, the airplane carries 30 and a half gallons of fuel. It stalls at a rather remarkable 32 knots, that's with flaps, but even with uh, everything clean on it, only 39, 
ASTM rules specify 45 knots, so they're a full six knots under. That's a slow stall, and having flown the predecessor designs of this design, I can attest to the fact that it is a great slow-flying aircraft. Uh, it uh, has also another interesting thing is it's got uh, wing luggage compartments and they are listed as two times 44 pounds. That's 88 pounds of wing uh, of uh, storage in the wings. Plus you've got all this space back here and what's commonly called a hat rack maybe on the far back. But right down in here a sign placard says it's another 33 pounds there. This airplane can carry some weight with it. And again, I've just got my hand on a handle here. Again, getting in and out of these airplanes. Here's another nice thing to have as you ease yourself into the seat. Of course, four-point seat belts, and we talked about how comfortable the seats are. But one more nice little detail. Just gets those wires out of the way. We all wear a headset these days. The plug-ins are right down here. Your camera may or may not show that. Uh, but that's going to mean that the wires, which could actually stash behind the seat here where my arm's going, you can get them all out of your way and not be tripping over wires in the cockpit. Just a lot of nice detail consciousness in the design of this Bristol airplane. Now, how many of these aircraft are actually out flying now then? Well, uh, we're told that the current count is about 50 airplanes flying. This is from a new company. Now they've done, they've got a lot of background, so really the number is kind of bigger than that. But of this particular model, 50 are flying, two in the United States, and they have logged seven sales just since September. And this is in the market that we all know is a pretty lousy market, so that's an impressive performance for a brand new design, first shown at AOPA in October of 2011 in the United States. Now, if we want to get some more information on the airplane, Dan, where would we go? Well, you just have to kind of remember the designer's name. His name is Milan Bristel. That name is B-R-I-S-T-E-L-L, -L, and it's Bristel.com. The name of the company is actually B-R-M Arrow. Uh, but the address, uh, bristel.com, and of course their U.S. representation will be noted on there. Now, do you have any information on this airplane? I do not yet, but we're going to be looking for a flight in this, and when that's available, and news and other things are available currently on bydanjohnson.com or bydanjohnson.com.